Well, welcome everyone. So I'm really excited to talk about uh, my book. So I wanted to start off just some, just kind of talking a little bit about this image. So I've been going to Bahia since 2001 when I was an undergraduate. I did a summer, uh, I mean a study abroad program when I was at NYU. And I took this picture, it's a graffiti on a wall going towards Praça da Sé and Pelodinho, the world, uh, UNESCO World Heritage Site. And I thought this was very interesting in terms of my research, especially since Italian men kind of feature prominently in discourses around sex tourism. So it's an image of uh, an older Italian man with a beard. He's carrying the flag of Italy. He's saying ciao. And up in the top corner, you see bienvenuti, which is welcome in, in Italian. And so I just thought that was uh, very interesting and telling that this is the graffiti image that's kind of uh, in the main tourist districts of Salvador. Okay, so before I talk about those t-shirts, I want to just tell, tell you a little bit about my entry into this project. So actually, when I was an undergraduate student, um, I spent six months in, in Brazil, part of the time in Sao Paulo, part of the time in Salvador, and I had an experience where I was on the beach with another African-American woman, and we would always speak to each other in Portuguese so that we can blend in. And these, a group of Italian men approached us and started speaking to us in Portuguese, and within five minutes, they were trying to bring us back to their hotel rooms. And my friend and I you know, looked at each other and we switched to English quickly. And when they overheard our English, they said, oh my gosh, we're so sorry. We didn't know you were American. We thought you were Brazilian. So that just got my wheels spinning because it made me think about how assumptions of black hypersexuality have come to characterize foreign tourists imaginaries of Brazil as a racial sexual paradise. Uh, and these questions persisted after I returned to the US when heterosexual men would often say things like, oh, I've heard about the women over there whenever I mentioned that I had been in Brazil. And this experience also illustrates uh, Kia Caldwell's point. She's a, an anthropologist who wrote a book called Negras in Brazil. And she makes this point that, uh, quote, diasporic anthropologists are often subjected to many of the same racialized and gender discourses and practices that we set out to examine in our research. Uh, so that was definitely something that I experienced in this, um, in this research. So that experience led me to uh, pursue this line of research when I went to graduate school. So I wanted to bring up these teachers. Has anyone seen these t-shirts before? So they came out right around the World Cup, uh, when the World Cup was set to take place in 2014 in Brazil. And as you know, Brazil has since hosted the Olympics. There's been lots of political turmoil and different things happening in recent years in Brazil. Um, so these t-shirts came out. And again, they featured this kind of sexualized imagery, um, looking to score in Brazil, featuring a this, you know, curvaceous woman. And then the I heart Brazil. But if you look, the heart is actually an upside down behind with the Brazilian bikini. So these are the kind of representations that um, have long been, been used to represent Brazil in the tourist imaginary. So they um, got a lot of criticism, right? The pre former president, Dilma Rousseff, said, Brazil is happy to receive tourists for the World Cup, but it is also ready to combat sex tourism. And um, the national tourism agency Embratur says, Embratur strongly repu repudiates the sale of products that link Brazil's image to sexual appeal. Um, and so on February 25th, 2014, Adidas agreed, Adidas was the one who made these shirts, and they agreed to pull the sexualized t-shirts. Um, Embratur president Flavio Dino wrote a letter to Adidas and says that Embratur works to combat this type of thing, particularly with the regard to the commodification and commercialization of the female body. The Brazilian people, and especially the Brazilian women, deserve that respect. Companies should never treat the bodies of Brazilian women and men as tourist attractions. So I found this um, very interesting in light of the research that I had done before this happened, because what I had found was that this story leaves out the fact that Embrasur and other Brazilian tourist agencies have actually played a role in perpetuating sexualized images of Brazilian women in tourist propaganda since the 1970s at least. So when we look at how Brazil has been marketed abroad, here's one example of a photo I took when I was doing my field work. Um, an Embrasur, the translation of the caption says, a long time ago, I was seduced by Brazil. So you have this image of the woman eating a piece of fruit, kind of gazing seductively at the viewer. So there's all these tropes of lure, seduction, that have, have characterized um, tourism marketing. There was another 2002 Embratur advertisement that had exotic round fruits, and the caption said, paradise exists, and with no forbidden fruit. Come to Brazil and get away from your tensions. 
So we see with these images, and I'll show some more, how women's sexuality is used to market Brazil as a tourism destination. And in Bahia, the black mecca of Brazil in the north Northeast, this tourism propaganda is racialized in particular ways. So this is a pamphlet that I um, found in the Bahia Tursa archives, the Bahian Tourism Agency. And have, has anyone read Jorge Amado novels? Gabriela Cloven Cinnamon. Okay, so this is, he's a famous Bahian um, author. His novels, his literature has been translated into dozens of languages. So in um, Ilios, uh, the, the Land of Gabriela, this tourism propaganda is using the image of Gabriela from the novel to, to market the town of Ilios in southern Bahia. So in Amado's novel, Gabriela Cloven Cinnamon, um, it has contributed to the image to images of Brazilian women of African descent that are exported abroad. Um, in this brochure, there is a video that goes along with it, and the video encompass, uh, combines scenic landscape views of beautiful, pristine beaches with the sensual, whispering voice of a female narrator who tells her audience, "You're going to fall in love for sure." The woman's voice refers to the, quote, sensuality in the clove and cinnamon skin color, end quote, as one appealing aspect of your potential visit to Ilios. Finally, the narrator says, quote, now you have an obligation, but with no obligations. Come, get to know me better. Live a romance with me. You won't be able to resist. It's a pleasure to meet you. And the tone of her voice emphasizes prazer, or pleasure, in a way that connotes an underlying yet obvious sexual innuendo. As the narrator utters these words, we see the image of a cinnamon-colored woman walking along the beach, her long mane of unruly black hair blowing in the wind as she sways her hips from side to side. Wearing a sarong and bikini top, she enters the water and splashes, throwing her hair back. And in the final scene, she indulges in a playful yet warm embrace with a white man. And so these type of images that have been used to market Brazil and Bahia have real life implications, right? So I remember when I was in graduate school at Stanford, I spoke to um, a professor of mine who was from Sao Paulo, and she told me about um, one time she was visiting Santos, this beach, beach uh, area in Sao Paulo State. She met a man from Switzerland and she asked him, oh, what brings you to, to Brazil, to Santos? And he says, I came in search of my Gabriela. So these kind of images have real implications. So, this example of the racialized erotics of tourism propaganda highlights one of the key arguments of my book, that sex tourism does not necessarily constitute a new phenomenon, but it is actually a transnational reiteration of processes that have already occurred historically in Brazil. So we see in the national imaginary of Brazil uh, the ways in which women of African descent, sometimes referred to as mulatas, have been seen as the national erotic icon. So this image shows a poster for Pan Am Airlines circa 1970. It was being optioned online by Swan Galleries. Um, and you can read the description, the Oba Oba dancers. Oh, I take a sip of water. So what, do, what does this image have to do with airlines, you might ask? That's a good question. I don't know. <laughs> but it just highlights the ways in which this is the common, the common theme, the common uh, way in which Brazil is represented. And so also when I was doing my field work, I encountered um, lots of postcards just walking through the tourist district. You'll have newsstands that sell candy and magazines and a whole sleeve of postcards. And at these, um, at these stands, I found all these postcards in which you see black women um, standing alone on a beach, uh, naturalized as part of the lush landscape. Um, and this ad is also um, something that's, that it's, it's to advertise a restaurant and it's um, talking about a folkloric show with authentic Bahian mulatas. And then you see the, the, the woman's image um, on there. So this is an example of one of the postcards that I, um, that I found when I was there. And what I found particularly interesting about this image is that the caption is the north coast of Bahia. So the caption doesn't even acknowledge the presence of a person in the image. Um, and also it's selling a particular uh, idealized image of Brazil because I don't know for people who've been to Brazil, if you've been to the beach in Brazil, is it common to find a totally empty beach with like one person waiting for you? <laughs> right? But beaches in Brazil are full with families, with you know, all kinds of people. So this, it's selling this, this kind of fantasy that you will arrive on this beach that just has one person waiting for you. Um, here's another example of a postcard. 
that I found and um, Patrick Larvey um, has said that Brazil's tourist industry promotes the country as one which offers sexual attractions as part of the nation's natural and cultural resources. So again, this young black woman, her face is superimposed on the Brazilian flag, which is also superimposed on this lush tropical landscape. And this image may lead you to believe that black women are, you know, uh, the center of the Brazilian nation, but we know that the ways in which they suffer from racism and sexism doesn't quite indicate that. And again, the postcard caption is the Brazilian flag, not mentioning the presence of a woman there. These are more, a little more graphic images, but again, these are postcards that I found just walking through the tourist district. So highlighting on, you know, certain features of the anatomy and the caption for the one up top uh, is the fly with no shame because there's actually a fly on her behind that many people might not notice, but that's, that's that. Um, and so these postcards show how Salvador is marketed to the world as the black mecca where blackness is both eroticized and sold as a tourist commodity. And even, um, um, and so the Bahian state government utilizes an eroticized blackness and Afro-Brazilian culture to sell Bahia to foreign tourists. Uh, while governmental and civil society campaigns tend to define sex tourism as something that happens when the state turns away its watchful eye, my research suggests that something different is actually happening in Salvador. So the eroticization and commodification of black culture and black bodies creates a situation where the tourist desires for exotic culture and erotic hypersexualized black bodies are often inextricable. Thus, Salvador is characterized by both the lure of Afro-Brazilian cultural heritage as well as the possibilities of sex. And so these representations of Brazilian women of African descent can be analyzed with Pat Patricia Hill Collins' framework of black sexual politics in which wild, untamed sexuality characterizes uh, Western representations of women and men of African descent. And as black Brazilian feminist uh, Lelio Gonzalez astutely points out, images of black women shift depending on their relationship to space. So while black women in public space are associated with entertainment, leisure, and the carnival atmosphere, black women in domestic or private space are associated with the drudgery of domestic work. And so this image comes from FIFA Weekly, so it's also uh, leading up to the World Cup. It's in an article called Brazil for, for Beginners. And so we can see um, that even the 2014 World Cup was not immune to the tendency to sexualize black women's bodies. Um, in this image in the FIFA Weekly, the article consists of tips for first time tourists to Brazil. And, it, and of course we see in the image it features two uh, brown skinned Afro-Brazilian women lying face down on the beach. Um, scantily clad in the well-known Brazilian bikini bottoms, the women lay watching as a diverse group of men play, um, play soccer. So why Brazil and why Bahia? So although sex tourism, of course, is something that happens all over the world, um, Thailand, Philippines, Cuba, Dominican Republic, Colombia are some well-known places. Brazil is also a significant site of sex tourism. And there is a surprising dearth of scholarship on sex tourism, although it's growing now. Um, and so Bahia is also unique in, in the context of Brazil because it's marketed as the black Mecca. Um, 75, an estimated 75 to 80% of the population of Bahia is Af African descent. And Salvador is the fourth largest tourism destination in Brazil um, and the largest tourism destination in the northeastern region. Bahia Tursa, the, the state tourism agency, has marketed Bahia as the terra de felicidade, or the land of happiness. And that's very important as well. Bahia also is a place that has very high levels of inequality. Um, statistics have shown that the income disparities, uh, income disparities are greater within the metropolitan region of Salvador than in Brazil as a whole. Um, so for instance, a resident in the richest area of Salvador earns 25 times what a resident in the poorest area of, of Salvador earns. Bahia also has one of the highest unemployment rates of the country. And Afro-descendants are more than half of Brazil's population and the largest group in favelas. Um, okay, and this is also, uh, I, I always like to show this image because it's a, a tourist map of Salvador. And who, well, I was going to ask a question, but I guess I'll just tell you. Um, so what's interesting about this, if you look at the green areas, you might think that that's just what, forest, you know, people, places where people don't live. But actually, the tour, because this is a tourist map, 
it's highlighting these tourist neighborhoods, so mostly the coastline, coastal areas. But the interior, the, the part in the green, is actually where a lot of the working class um, population of Bahia of Salvador lives. So it's very interesting that on this map, it's kind of just cast in that um, as just blank space, right? Um, so I also wanted to just mention in terms of thinking about how um, how people are responding to tourism. This is uh, Simply Sabotaging. It's a local Bayan hip hop group. And in the lead up to the World Cup, um, they made a song called Meu Lovor Pelas Manifestações. If you remember, there was a lot of manifestations um, in the lead up to the World Cup in Brazil. And part of it was around bus fare, hikes, um, you know, all these different ways in which uh, people were protesting the fact that Brazil was spending all this money to prepare for the World Cup to get stadiums ready. But meanwhile, schools, health, you know, hospitals, all these different things were suffering. So a few of the lyrics of this song highlight the tourism industry, um, how the tourism industry impacts inequality in Bahia. So uh, to quote from the song, they said, I would like to be a tourist here in my city to be treated with a bit of dignity. I would like to be a tourist here in my country to see if at least I would be able to be happy. The most popular carnival in the world because it's made for the world and not for me. I am forgotten in the background. I'm not received with bone fiend ribbons, police carrying gringos luggage. For them, camarochis with the finest buffets and our children selling peanuts. So just kind of highlighting um, camarochis, if you don't know, that's in Carnival, you have these stands where you have to pay to get access to them to kind of sit in this elevated position and watch Carnival in Salvador. So that's also a sign of the, the class, uh, the wealth disparities. Um, so this is an image of Pelorinho in the UNESCO World Heritage Site that I took um, many years ago. And so Salvador is unique because it's uh, one of the few destinations that is in Brazil that is situated unequivocally as a site of Afro-Brazilian culture. And um, an Afro-Brazilian tour guide that I interviewed, um, who will call Jose Val, he says that black culture is the great attraction that makes Bahia third in the national tourism ranking. If you take away African culture, Bahia has nothing. Racism in Bahia is very perverse. It's hidden. They like, like black culture, but they don't accept black people. Black culture is OK, but black people know. This culture is sucked dry, but black people remain poor. And in this image, I'm not sure if you can see it, what's happening here is there's a outfit. So there's a bayana and a capoeirista. You know, so a capoeirista, a person who does capoeira, martial arts, there's an Afro wig, there's a turban. So tourists can basically go and stand behind these figures, and so they dress up as a bayana and a capoeirista. And I actually, um, you know, did some observations there and saw many, you know, uh, North American um, people going up and kind of having a lot of fun doing kind of... Uh, taking on this, this representation of blackness. Um, here's another uh, you know, representation of, of how black culture is for sale in Bahia. And this cartoon image, is, I found it very interesting, because it's from a Bahia Tursa pamphlet um, with tips for, for tourists. And this is the image that they chose to represent, right? Um, a blonde, you know, blue-eyed man with the, the Olodum hat with built-in extensions with beads on them. and this. We see that on the mannequin in the store as well. So um, moving into kind of the overview of the book and also some of the few, you know, few of the stories and major arguments from the book. So here's the, the chapter breakdown. And of course, in terms of methods, um, Ethnography was the main main method, uh, mostly particip participant observation and interviews. I attended a wide range of activities promoted for tourists and frequented um, various tourscape locales. I also did archival research on tourist propaganda at the Bahia Tursa Library in Salvador. Uh, there's a lot of analysis of visual images and representations of the city as a tourist destination. Um, I also uh, worked or collaborated with two women's organizations, Aprosba and Shami, which I'll talk a little bit more about. And then I did interviews with a broad range of people, including foreign tourists, tourism industry workers, sex workers, um, and then also everyday Afro-Brazilian men and women who have to contend with foreigners' uh, stereotypical assumptions about them, and also with governmental and civil society campaign, um, people involved in campaigns to eradicate sex tourism and trafficking. So in terms of um, my goals, it was important to me to write a book that would be accessible for undergraduates, especially given that I do teach at a, 
undergraduate liberal arts institution, um, but also for scholarly and lay audiences. And I, I was really interested in, in complicating the sensationalist narratives about sex tourism that often circulate in the media. Um, and I wanted to also present multiple perspectives on, on this phenomenon that has garnered tremendous worldwide attention. So a few of the big um, overarching arguments. Uh, many scholars of sex tourism has, have noted that it's, it's not an anomaly. Sex tourism is not an anomaly. Rather, it's merely one strand of the gendered tourism industry in which sexual services are part and parcel of a range of informal services available. And I'm thinking of people like Cynthia Inlow and Kamala Kempadu here. Um, and so in the case of Salvador, the cultural and sexual economies of tourism are inextricably linked in Salvador's uh, tourism industry. And this is one of the things that I think makes this site unique um, over you know, other, other places where sex tourism has been studied. And I also talk about what I call the specter of sex tourism. And this it suggests the broad and wide ranging implications of sex tourism that go far beyond sex relations between sex workers and sex tourists. So for instance, the meaning and implications of, this, of sex tourism for daily life, romantic relationships, and transnational mobility. The specter of sex tourism creates anxieties about the validity and authenticity of romantic relationships between foreign tourists and Bayans. And sex tourism affects how people relate to each other across transnational borders. And then, of course, is the concept of ambiguous entanglements, which I use to refer to a broad range of liaisons and relationships that are forged in this tourscape of Salvador. And so this concept helps me to highlight how sexual relations uh, move beyond mere commercial exchanges to encompass intimate and emotional exchanges as well. And I'll talk about that with a few of the um, ethnographic examples. So this is um, a, a image from a brochure from Shami, which is the Centro Humanitario de Apoyo a Mulher, the Humanitarian Center for the Support of Women. So this organization was founded in 94 by a woman named Jacqueline Lechi, and its purpose is to raise awareness about sex tourism and trafficking. Um, so I always thought this image was very interesting because it, it just, you know, kind of captures a lot of people's thoughts about sex tourism, about the dangers. So when they're trying to raise awareness about sex tourism, they're warning, you know, young Afro-Brazilian women who are kind of enamored by this thought of an opportunity to go to Europe. So meeting this European man who can rescue them or save them or take them away from um, their life in, in Bahia, their kind of limited options and things like that. So he's kind of standing in this door, it almost, it's almost like a door of opportunity. She's smitten with the hearts above her head, she's poised, ready to jump, he's welcoming her. So it's all, there's a lot going on in this image. But also what you find in, you know, uh, elsewhere in the pamphlet and in a lot of their uh, materials is that they're, th this, this may look like an opportunity, but it often comes with different risks, right? That there's a risk of her being a victim of trafficking, there's a risk of her being exploited and things like that. Um, sorry. Okay, so, and this is a, the logo of APROSBA, the Association of Prostitutes of Bahia, um, which is another organization that I worked with. It was founded in 1997. It's an organization that was run for, by and for prostitutes. Uh, some of their they're, um, they're concerned with combating violence, um, HIV AIDS prevention, eradicating stigma, and sex workers' rights. Um, and so though it's important to note that though adult prostitution is legal in Brazil, the stigma of prostitution and poor working conditions still persist. And so um, according to Fabiana, one of the co-founders, she says, we want to show that prostitutes are also dignified people who exercise a profession like any other. And so at the time of its founding, sex workers in Salvador um, faced discrimination, unwanted pregnancies, sexual and physical assault by both clients and police officers, and a lack of knowledge about the prevention of HIV AIDS and other sexually transmitted infections. And so through the work of the organization, they've uh, worked on, on that. So some of the ways that um, sex workers affiliated with the PROSBA um, that they had diverse ways of understanding how their sexual, intimate, and emotional labor intersected with the exchange of money, gifts, and even opportunities to travel abroad. 
So for instance, Patricia was a 25-year-old black woman I met uh, who spoke some Eng Sp Spanish and English. And she said that her clients regularly paid her around uh, 50 reais for the programa, or the sexual exchange. But they also gave her presents as well. And so she had had the opportunity to travel to Italy, Chile, and Argentina with gringo clients. And she said, I prefer all gringos. They're more caring, and they pay well. They need cariño, or care, affection. Um, she says, I like it. I'm very caring, end quote. And so quite a few of the sex workers that I spoke with also expressed the sentiment of self-value that was tied to the act of charging for sexual services. So in fact, it was precisely by charging for sexual services that they were si valorizando, or valuing themselves. Um, so for instance, when Fabiana was asked why she became a prostitute by a journalist, she said, because I wanted to be a prostitute. I like to have sex, orgasms, and earn my money. So why not do it all at the, t at the same time? The journalist was unsatisfied by her answer, so he pressed her by asking why she wanted to. And her response to the journalist's persistent questioning was as follows. Because I'm valuing my body. Before, I was having a lot of sex and I didn't have money to buy bread. Now I'm valuing my body by charging. So Fabiana's bold statement is revealing of deep fissures within feminism and raises questions about how researchers, researchers can engage with and interpret how our, research, uh, how our participants articulate their experiences. So whether one embraces an abolitionist feminist perspective on prostitution that sees it as immoral and an irrefutable manifestation of women's subjugation and patriarchy, or a sex worker's rights perspective that sees sex work as a type of labor like any other with the potential to be empowering or exploitative will influence how one interprets Fabiana's words. So for me, part of the power of ethnography is to delve deeply and to take people's words, stories, practices, behaviors, and experiences seriously. So these images are um, <clears throat> just a few more examples of the, the work that APROSBA uh, does in terms of raising awareness about safer sex practices and fighting for uh, sex workers' rights. So this um, pamphlet has a berimbau, which is an instrument used in capoeira to play uh, in the Afro-Brazilian martial art, and has a condom on the berimbau. So it says, amor que cuida, like love that, that takes care, love that cares. And this is from a national project um, called the, the Without Shame Project. So without shame to fight for, for your rights. So uh, it was part of a national network of um, sex workers association. OK, so just a few more um, themes or uh, stories that I wanted to share with you. So another uh, key finding that I, that I um, another key finding was that processes of gendered racism in Bahia create a situation in which black sex workers had to confront, confront things that their white counterparts did not. <clears throat> So even Fabiana, a white Brazilian woman who was the co-founder and lead organizer um, of a prosba, was aware of racial disparities that affected sex workers in Bahia. She said, quote, I've seen that black sex workers suffer more. They were arrested and detained while I was able to leave the police station. <clears throat> Fabiana also had experiences in which she was able to come and go as she pleased in hotels. Her whiteness rendered her invisible as a sex worker. In addition to being subjects of surveillance and criminalization in a way that white sex workers were almost immune to, foreign clients also asked black sex workers to do domestic work as well. Thus, for black Bayan women, domestic work and sex work were seen as two sides of the same coin. In a context in which domestic work was seen as the ultimate form of exploitation, in which black women were poorly paid, subject to harsh working conditions, and often susceptible to sexual assault by their employers, sex work was often seen as a more lucrative and autonomous uh, alternative. And just a, a statistic that's important to point out, uh, in Brazil, one in three Afro-Brazilian women uh, works as a domestic worker. And that's uh, from an article by Patricia Pino from 2010. So my interviews with sex workers also revealed that, um, that foreign tourists often seek much more than commodified bodies in their adventures abroad. So in addition to the programa, or the sexual exchange, commercial sexual transaction, the men often wanted women to stay in their hotels or on their ships for several days, to go out to dinner, to go shopping. So the financial rewards of uh, sex with foreigners only told part of the story. 
The prospect of gifts, intimacy, affection, and cosmopolitanism were also uh, an integral part of the advantages that some sex workers saw in doing programmas with foreigners as opposed to Brazilian clients. Um, another thing that I, that I encountered in the field um, was this case of mistaken identity. Uh, so this has to do with notions of black hypersexuality that, that circulate, where even black women who were not sex workers, um, they constantly had to negotiate being mistaken for sex workers by foreign tourists. Um, so when I spoke with people about sex tourism in Bahia, many expressed a veritable checklist of things that one needs to consider in order to determine if one is in a sex tourist relationship. And in Salvador, the mere act of a black Brazilian woman walking hand in hand with the white foreign tourist could be read as what Kristen Smith calls a, quote, moment of racialized encounter that makes blackness legible. So even if this black woman was not a sex worker, even if she has a real relationship with a foreigner instead of a fleeting liaison, she's often read by society as a sex worker. Um, for instance, there was a woman I talked with named uh, Katya, who's a 35-year-old middle-class black woman educator. Um, she told me that she has had more unpleasant experiences with tourists mistaking her for a prostitute than she could count. Um, she said that black women in Bahia are seen as an extension of all the pleasurable things that give Salvador its reputation as a party capital and the land of happiness. So, in a sense then, black Brazilian women, whether or not they are sex workers, are marked as outside of the bounds of sexual respectability simply because of assumptions about their hypersexuality. Um, so just as Kathy Cohen in her classic essay argues that some heterosexuals find themselves on the margins of heterosexual privilege when their sexual choices are seen as abnormal or immoral, sex workers, regardless of their race, are situated on the margins of respectability as a consequence of their stigmatized sexual practices. So I'm aware, I don't want to go too over my time, um, so maybe I should uh, wrap up. I, have a, I can talk, if people want to ask in the Q&A, I can talk more about um, some of the interviews that I did with sex tourists and hotel workers um, who had a lot of things to say about particularly Italian tourists. Um, and um, I could also talk about uh, this film that came out. Have people seen the film Cinderella's Wolves and a Prince Charming by Joel Zito Araujo? So that's a documentary film that came out um, a few years ago. That's the first film to offer an in-depth exploration of the transnational circuits of sex and marriage between Brazilian women of African descent and European men. So there was a lot of uh, overlaps in, uh, in, in the film, what I saw in the documentary and in, in the, the work that I did. And we even talked to some of the same people. So, so I'll just go to the conclusion. Um, the process of doing my ethnographic research challenged many of the initial assumptions I had about sex tourism. So members of Aprozba told me stories of empowerment, police violence, romantic dreams, and cosmopolitan desires. They told stories about falling in love with foreign ship workers, about traveling to visit their clients slash boyfriends' countries, about escaping police violence and abuse from domestic clients and boyfriends to the arms of a gringo cariñoso or caring, affectionate foreign man who gave them access to their own city in a way that they had never had before. These complicated stories of affect, desire, strategy, and risk that did not fit into conventional narratives of a phenomenon that has been considered the dark side of tourism made it clear that in this context, sex tourism is not a simple and clear-cut manifestation of geopolitical, racial, and gender inequality, sexual exploitation, and the excesses of consumption and mass tourism. So this, I hope, is a reminder to quote um, Patty Dewey, um, Susan Dewey and Patty Kelly, that ethnography's greatest potential contribution to public policy lies in its ability to represent the everyday realities of life for individuals who often constitute a population invisible to policymakers. So um, sex tourism is a complex subject of analysis because it requires interrogating notions of desire, intimacy, love, affect, and reciprocity. Um, and I would note that since publishing the book, Aprozba has unfortunately shut down. Um, there's been a kind of 
shift, a political shift in the Brazilian government. Many of you probably have been accompanying that. Um, but that's had implications in the sex workers' rights movement, which was very strong and powerful in Brazil. Um, but with the growing kind of evangelical, um, conservative politicians, they are, you know, that the support has been um, drying up. So they, they are no longer open, which I think has, uh, is going to have major implications in terms of people's health and well-being in Salvador. So I will stop there and welcome any questions you may have. Thank you.